Okay, y'all, are y'all ready to do another reading in the Ponder Heart? If you remember last time uh, in the book, we have Edna Earl who is narrating and uh, she is talking mainly about her uncle Daniel, who is just a little bit older than her. And we come to realize that uncle Daniel is, you know, he's just a little bit slow and um, he loves to give things away. When I say slow, I meant just a little bit mentally slow. And he loves to give things away. And uh, he had given her the uh, Beulah, which was the hotel or, you know, boarding house, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then he, uh, Grandpa at one point decided it was time to put him in the asylum. And he would get these, you know, breaks from the asylum. And so the one time when it was time to go back and Grandpa took him back, well, the nurse there thought Grandpa was the patient and kept him and um, Uncle Daniel took off. And <clears throat> so now we're getting ready to pick back up again. And if you haven't, if you're just joining, um, you can go back in my videos and get the first reading. This is the second reading today. And I want to show you my shirt too. Um, it says, let it snow. Now, I don't like snow. So, and let's just look at it. So down below it says somewhere else. Okay. So if it's going to snow, fine, as long as it's somewhere else, not here. So let's pick up reading in our book. Uncle Daniel had got clear up to his 40s before we ever dreamed that such a thing as love flittered through his mind. He's so sweet. Sometimes I think if we hadn't showed, showed him that widow, but he was bound to see her. He has eyes. Miss Tea Cake McGee. Boy, how would you like for your name to be Tea Cake? She lived here all her life. She sings the choir of the Baptist Church every blessed Sunday. Couldn't get her out and sings louder than all the rest put together. So loud it would make you lose your place. I'll go back for a little bit. Of course, we're all good Presbyterians. Grandpa was an elder. The Beulah Bible class and the Beulah Hotel are both named after Grandma. And my other grandma was the second to longest living Sunday school teacher they ever had. Very highly regarded. Poor little mama got a patchet written before she died. And I still conduct the rummage sales for the Negroes every Saturday afternoon in the corner of the yard and bring in a sum for the missionaries in Africa. And I think would be in Africa that I think would surprise you now. Remember, this book was written um, back, um, I forget now what year it was written, but it was back, you know, many, many years ago. And, you know, things were different then. Um, okay, let me get back to where I was. Miss T. Kate McGee is, of course, a cis trunk. The cis trunks are all Baptist big Baptist and Professor McGee's widow. He wasn't a professor of anything, just real smart, smarter than the cis trunks anyway. He never worked either. He was like Uncle Daniel in that respect. With Miss Tea Cake, everything dates from since I lost Professor McGee. If a passenger train hit him. That shows you how long ago his time was. Uncle Daniel thought that he was wild. Uh, Uncle Daniel thought what he was wild about at that time was the fair. And I kept saying to myself, maybe that was it. He carried my plant over Monday in the tub and entered it for me as usual under best other than named. It took the blue ribbon and went on through the flowers and quilts and the art passing out compliments on both sides of him and out the other door of the fine arts tent and was loose on the midway. From then on, the whole week long, he'd go back to the fair every whipstitch morning, noon, and 
or night, hand in hand with any soul, man, woman, or child that chose to let him, and spend his change on them and stay till the cows come home. He'd even go by himself. I went with him till I dropped, and we'd no more leave than he'd clamp my arm. Edna Earl, look back yonder down the hill at those lights still a burning, like he'd never seen lights before. He'd say, shh, listen, at intrepid Elsie Fleming. Intrepid Elsie Fleming rode a motorcycle around the wall of death, which let her do if she wants to ride a motorcycle that bad. It was the time she wasn't riding I objected to. When she was out front on the platform warming up her motor, that was nearly the whole time. You could hear her day and night in the remotest parts of this hotel and with the sheet over her head, clear over the sound of the merry-go-round and all. She dressed up in pants. Uncle Daniel said he had to admire that. He admired everything he saw at the fair that year. To tell the truth, and everything he heard and always expected to win the Indian bas Indian blanket never did. They never let him. I'll never forget when I first realized what flittered through his mind. He had belted me into the Ferris wheel then vanished. Instead of climbing into the next car, and the first thing I made out from the middle of the air was Uncle Daniel's big round hat up on the platform of the Escapades sideshow, right in the middle of those ostrich plumes. There he was, passing down the line of those girls doing their come on dance out front and handing them out ice cream cones right while they were shaking their heels to the music, not in very good time. He got the cream from the Baptist ladies' tent, banana and melting fast. And I couldn't get off the Ferris wheel till I'd been around my nine times, no matter how often I told them who I was. When I finally got loose, I flew up to Uncle Daniel and he stood there and hardly knew me, licking away and beside himself with pride and joy. And his, six, and his 60 cents were gone too. Well, he would have followed the fair to Silver City when it left if I turned around good. He kept telling me for a week after that those dancing girls wore beyond compare the prettiest dresses and feather pieces he ever saw on ladies' backs in his life and could dance like the fairies. They everyone smiled at me, he said, and yet I like Miss Elsie Fleming very well, too. So the only thing to be thankful for is he didn't try to treat intrepid Elsie Fleming she might have bitten him. As for Grandpa, I didn't tell him about the 12 banana ice cream cones and where they went, but he heard. He played dominoes with Judge Tip, and as soon as he got home from the Clanahans, he took a spell with his heart, the ponder heart. So, of course, we were all running and flying to do his bidding. Everything under the sun, he said, I never saw such lovely things as people sent. I gained 10 pounds and begged people to spare us more. more. Of course, I was running out there day and night and tended to the Beulah between times. One morning when I carried Grandpa his early coffee, which he wasn't supposed to have, he said to me, Edna Earl, I've been debating. I've just come to a conclusion. What now, Grandpa, I said, tell me real slow. Well, he did, and to make a long story short, he had his way. And after that, he never had another spell in his life till the one that killed him, when Uncle Daniel had his way. The heart's a remarkable thing, if you ask me. I'm fixing to be strict for the first time with the boy, was Grandpa's conclusion. I'm going to fork up a good wife for him, and you put your mind on who? I'll do my best, Grandpa, I said, but remember, we haven't got the whole wide world to choose from anymore. Mamie Clanahan's all re-engaged to the man that came to put the dial telephone in clay. 
Suppose we cross the street to the Baptist church the first Sunday you're out of danger. So up rose Miss T. Cake McGee from the choir. Her solo always came during collection to cover up people rattling change and dropping money on the floor. And when I told Uncle Daniel to just listen to that, it didn't throw such a shadow over his countenance as you might have thought. Miss Tea Cake's got more breath in her than those at the fair. That's what she's got, he whispers back to me. And before I could stop his hand, he had dropped three silver dollars, his whole month's allowance, in the collection plate with a clatter that echoed all over that church. Grandpa fished the dollars out when the plate came by him and sent me a frown, but he didn't catch on. Uncle Daniel sat there with his mouth in an O clear through the rest of the solo. It seems to me it was work for the night, for the night is coming. But I was saying to myself, well, Edna Earl, she's a sister aunt, and a widow well taken care of, and she makes and sells those gorgeous cakes that melt in your mouth. She's an artist. I forget about her singing, so going out of church, I says, Eureka, Grandpa, I found her, and whispers in his ear. Go ahead then, girl, says he. If you'd ever known Grandpa, you'd have been as surprised as I was when Grandpa didn't object right away. And conclude we better find somebody smarter than that or drop the whole idea. Excuse me. <coughs> Grandpa would be a lot more willing to stalk up on a wedding and stop it than encourage one to go on. Anybody's, yours, mine, or the Queen of Sheba's. He regarded getting married as a show of weakness of character in nearly every case but his own because he was smart enough to pick a wife very nearly as smart as he was. But he was ready to try anything once for Uncle Daniel, and Miss Tea Cake got by simply because Grandpa knew who she was in a little bit because of her hair as black as tar, something she gets from Silver City and puts on herself in front of the mirror. Poor Grandpa. Suppose I'd even attempted over the years to step off. I dread to think of the links. Grandpa would have gone to stop it. Of course, I'm intended to look after Uncle Daniel, and everybody knows it. But in plenty of marriages, there's three, three all your life, because nearly everybody's got somebody. I used to think if I could ever step off with, say, Mr. Springer, Mr. Springer, Uncle Daniel wouldn't mind. He always could make Mr. Springer laugh, and I can name the oldest child after Grandpa and win him over quick before he knew it. Grandpa adored compliments, though he tried to hide it. Ponder Springer, that sounds perfectly plausible to me, or did at one time. At any rate, Uncle Daniel and Miss Tea Cake got married. I just asked for her recipes enough times and told her the real secret of cheese straws, beat it 300 strokes, and took back a few unimportant things I've said about the Baptist. The wedding was at the cis trunks in the music room, and Miss Tea Cake insisted on singing at her own wedding, sang the sweetest story ever told. It was bad luck. The marriage didn't hold out. We were awfully disappointed, Miss Tea Cake, but glad to have Miss Uncle Daniel back. What Uncle Daniel told me he didn't take to, I asked him because I was curious, was hearing spool hills coming and going on Professor McGee's floor. But he never had a word to say against Miss Tea Cake. I think he liked her. Uncle Daniel has remarkable affection for everybody and everything in creation. I asked him one question about her and got this whole tale. Miss Tea Cake settled down again now and don't seem to be considering catching anybody else in particular still singing. So Grandpa carried Uncle Daniel to the asylum, and before too long, Uncle Daniel turned the tables on Grandpa and never had to go back there. Meantime, here traipsed into town 
a little thing from a way off down in the country near Polk. You wouldn't have ever heard of Polk. I hadn't. Bonnie D. Peacock, a little thing with yellow fluffy hair. The peacocks are the kind of people keep the mirror outside on the front porch and go out and pick railroad lilies to bring inside the house and wave at trains till the day they die. The most they probably hoped for was that somebody would come find oil in the front yard and fly in the house and tell them about it. Bonnie D. was one of nine or ten and no bigger than a minute. A good gust of wind might have carried her off any day. She traipsed into clay all by herself and lived and boarded with some bodkins on Depot Street and went to work in the ten cent store. All she knew how to do was make change. So that very day after Uncle Daniel finished finished, finished turning the tables and was just through telling us about it and we were all having a conniption fit in here, Uncle Daniel moseyed down the store down the street and in five minutes was inside the ten cent store. That was where he did all his shopping. He was intending to tell his story in there, I think, but instead of that he was saying to the world in general and Bonnie D at the jewelry counter in particular, I've got a great big house standing empty and my father's Studebaker. Come on, marry me. Could you imagine being in a store and some man came up to you and said, I have this and that. Come on, marry me. And I don't think so. You see how things happen? Miss Ludie Powell, Uncle Daniel's old school teacher, was in there at the time buying a spool of thread and she heard it, but just didn't believe it. I was busy, busy, busy with two things that afternoon, worrying about what I'd say to Grandpa when he got back and conducting my rummage cell in the yard. I might as well have been in Jericho. If Uncle Daniel had told me what he was going in the 10 cent store to say, but I doubt strongly if he knew himself, he's so sudden quick, I could have predicted it part way. And I could pretty well um, have predicted the answer. Because Uncle Daniel can't help it. He always makes everything sound grand. Home on the hill talk, great big car, homegrown bacon and eggs and ham and fried grits and potato cakes and honey and molasses for breakfast every morning to start off with. You know, you don't have to have all the brilliances in the world to sound grand. Or be grand either. It's a gift. The first thing I knew of what transpired was two hours and a half later when I was $2.95 to the good of the heathen, selling away as hard as I could and dead on my feet in the yard. Then bang up against the hitching post at the curb, pulls in that Studebaker. It honks and the motor huffs and puffs and the whole car is shaking all over like it does if you stop too quick after running it too long. It's been going all day too. I shade my eyes, and who do I see but old Narcissus at the steering wheel. She's the cook out at the place. She's looking at me very mournful and meaning and important. She always does look like that, but I never in my life knew she knew how to drive. Oh, oh, I says to the rummage cell, don't anybody touch a thing till I get back, and I march out to meet it. There in the back seat sat Uncle Daniel, big as life. And right beside him, Bonnie D. Peacock batting her eyes. Uncle Daniel, dear heart, why don't you get out and come in? I says, speaking just to him first. And Eva's sis trunk, the one that's a little older than me, just passing by with nothing to do, stopped in her tracks and politely listened in. Eva, how's your family? Says Uncle Daniel. He was beaming away for all he was worth and sh shooting up his arm every minute to wave. Of course, Saturday traffic was traveling around the square. Those people had just spent the morning waving him goodbye, seeing him off to the asylum with Grandpa, 
by next time around, they know everything, I look straight at Narcissus. Narcissus is spending her time till she's got a big crowd. Then she sings out real high and said, Mr. Daniel Dunn took a new wife, Miss Edna Earl. Um, just because Uncle Daniel asked a favor because the Studebaker wouldn't run for him, the minute he got it back where it belonged, Narcissus hitched herself right in the front seat and up and up to the wheel, and here they flew. Got Bonnie D from in front of Woolworths, and nobody saw it which I think is worth mentioning. I believe they picked her up without stopping and went kiting off to Silver City and a justice of the peace with a sign in the yard married them. Uncle Daniel let Narcissus pick out where to go and Narcissus picked out Silver City because she'd never been. None of them had ever been. It was the only spot in creation they could have gone to without finding somebody that knew enough to call Clay one two three and I'd answer. Silver City's too progressive. Here they rolled back all three as. Here they rolled back all three as pleased and proud as punch, as what they had accomplished. It wasn't lost on me, for all the length Narcissus had her mouth drawn down to. I hadn't even had my bath. I just stood there, in my raggediest shade hat and that big black rummage cell purse weighing me down. All traffic stopped, and Eva's sis drunk with her face and mind just looking. So, Miss Tea Cake's an old story, I said. All right, Uncle Daniel, this makes you two. Makes me three, he said. Hop out a minute, sugar, down to the road where Edna Earl and them can see you, he says to the child. But she sits there without a hat to her name, bat in her eyes. I married Mrs. McGee, and I married this young lady, and way before that was the Tom Thumb wedding. That was in church. And it was. He has the memory of an elephant. When he was little, he was in the Tom Thumb wedding, Mama's pageant. And everybody says it was the sweetest miniature wedding they had ever been, had ever been held here. He was the bridegroom, and I believe to my soul, Bertie Bakken was the postmistress, was the bride. The Bakkens have gone down since. They left the platform together on an Irish mail decorated with southern smilex, pumping hard. I've been told I was the flower girl, but I don't remember it. I don't remember it at all. And here Uncle Daniel sat with that first little bride right on tap and counting her. Step out in the pride a minute and see what I give you, he says to Bonnie D. So she stood down in the road on one foot, dusty as could be, in a homemade pink ball dress that wouldn't have even that wouldn't have stood even a short trip. It was wrinkled as tissue paper. And he says, Look, and Earl, look, you all, couldn't you just eat her up? I wish you could have seen Bonnie D. I wish you could. I guess I'd known she was living, but I'd never given her a real good luck. Look, she was just now getting her breath. Baby yellow hair, downy like one of those dandelion puffballs puff you can blow and tell the time by and not a grain beneath. Now Uncle Daniel may not have a whole lot of brains, but what's there is ponder and mo no mistake about it. But poor little Bonnie D, there's a world of difference. He talked, and she just stood there and took her fill of my rummage cell, held up there under the tree without offering a word. She was little and she was dainty under the dust of that trip, but I could tell by her little coon eyes she was shallow as they come. Turn around, I says as nicely as I can, and let's see some more of you. Nobody had to tell Donnie D, Bonnie D how to do that. She went puff, puff right on around and gave a dip at the end. Uncle Daniel hollers out to her, That's my hotel, sugar. He had forgotten. Hold on just a second. Hop back in and I'll show you my house. 
I could have spanked her. She hopped in and he gave her a big kiss. So Narcissus pulls out the throttle and don't back up, but just cuts the corner through the crowd. And as they thunder off around the courthouse, she lets out real high and sad. Miss Adna Earl, Mr. Sam, ain't back yet, is he? She was so proud of that ride she could die. She and Uncle Daniel rode off with what they had them proud together. Okay, we're going to stop there um, today, and we will pick up reading from there. Okay, it's getting interesting, isn't it? He, he tricks uh, Grandpa, kind of, and he gets out of the asylum, leaves Grandpa there, um, goes and gets Narcissus, their cook, to drive for him, sees um, Bonnie D in the Five and Dime store, and ups and goes to a city over, and they get married, and um, so we're just going to see what happens from there, aren't we? Okay, y'all have a good week, and if you just came in on this, make sure to go back and read the, uh, watch the other video to get caught up. Um, if you are enjoying this, make sure to give me a thumbs up, hit the, you know, thumbs up, um, symbol there and share it on your social media outlets um, if you haven't subscribed then hit the subscribe button and the bell so you'll be notified when i upload again okay y'all have a good evening bye bye